Manu Pilla is the author of the critically acclaimed The Ivory Throne, Chronicles of the House of Travancore, and Rebel Sultans, The Deccan from Khilji to Shivaji. Formerly Chief of Staff to MP Shashi Tharoor, he is also a winner of the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puruskar in 2017. His other essays and writings on history have appeared in Mint Lounge, The Hindu, Hindustan Times, Open, The New Statement, and other publications. The Courtesan, the Mahatma, and the Italian Brahmin is his third book. Prem Panikar is a journalist based in Bangalore. He was one of the founding members of Readif.com. From 2001 to 2006, he was based in New York City as the editor of India Abroad, the largest Indian, um, Indian American newspaper. He was managing editor for India at Yahoo between 2010 and 2014. He translated the Malayalam novel Randamuram, which is the Mahabharata told from the point of view of Bhima into English. He is the co-founder of the multimedia website peeply.org. Currently, he consults with media houses and corporates on content and social media strategy. Over to both of you. Thank you. Um, are we done moving people around? Sounds good. Uh, Manu, usually the template for these things is that the audience questions get uh, come after the discussion or whatever, which I think is unfair to the audience because this whole thing is for the audience. I want to flip this a little bit and start with one particular question that is sent to me. Uh, this is a young kid. Uh, is this the one on Twitter? No, this one is uh, from a young uh, kid who's interested in history, who's going all the way to the US and studying humanities, um, which seems you know, counterintuitive. The question he had was, was there something about your family or education background that got you interested in history, or was it the other way around? No, my formal education had nothing to do with history. It was a minor subject in college, so it was always a, a personal passion. And the personal passion came because I had an expert grandmother who was a, a superb storyteller, uh, to the extent that you know we'd study in school. Uh, our textbooks were all about women being victims, essentially. You know, they had to be reformed, they had to be saved, they had to be uh, treated better. You know, it was always, always as though till the 19th century, until these Indian reformers, who also happened to be nationalists, came about. Uh, the women were all sort of, you know, leading very uh, depressive lives. But then we'd go to Kerala in the summers, in, in the summer vacations. And uh, my grandmother came from a family where the women were not uh, particularly submissive. And because the social system there was structured in a way that while it wasn't fully equal, it was far less unfair in comparison to other places. So the result was uh, grandmothers who could sort of tame elephants and sort of frighten away tax collectors whom they didn't like. A uh, great-great-grandmother who had divorced her first husband because he wasn't necessarily up to the mark. I mean, his mistake was that uh, he, they had a baby, the baby was stillborn, and the child was female. Now, in a matrilineal line, you need females to continue the line. So when a stillborn baby was born, they, they said, there's something wrong with this man. So when he came back to the house, they said, we don't want to see you here again. And when we were growing up, there was a rock there where they say that he sat there and cried for an entire hour. And, you know, his mother-in-law didn't budge, and he eventually had to go away. And the story ends you know, on a sort of sad but also sweet note, which is that about 30, 33 years later, when he was dying, he sent his karyasthan or his manager uh, to our place saying, you know, Angit Marikana, which is he's dying, uh, he wants to see her one last time. Now, obviously, by then, she had married somebody else, she had kids, etc., so she was no, in no state to go. But uh, she sent her kids, and her kids went and actually met this ex-husband of their mothers. And the thing is, the marriage was in the 1880s, the divorce was in 1883 or so. This man was dying around 1916. So this is, you know, way before my time, this was the kind of uh, stuff that was happening there. And the other thing was also the fact that it was this that opened my eyes to the, to the idea that historical figures or people who came before me were not sitting with their spines erect and thinking chase thoughts all day long because my, one of my great uncles had four wives in a, in a, you know, one after the other, each of whom he discarded for various reasons. His brother littered an entire village with illegitimate children. And these are all from, you know, from his various partners and very prominent families in that area. And so, you know, we, my grandmother would go for a walk and she'd say, ah, that one's supposed to be my cousin. Oh, here there's a goldsmith's daughter, she was my uncle's, you know what. You know, so there was all this happening. And the thing was, it wasn't about good or bad, it was simply the fact that they were human beings. Right. They had their measure of flaws, they had their measure of greatness, they had their measure of humanity, essentially. So, so long as you don't judge them, you start realizing that history is actually a very exciting place. There's lots of interesting things happening. 
and at the end of the day they're not gods on a pedestal negotiating you know, on some other planet you know that's not how they made history they were human beings they went about it like we do today it's just that we have now ascribed certain values to them which may not all necessarily have been completely real so seeing this in my own family context the fact that we had such colorful ancestors and stories around us where divorce was possible where people you know these are upper caste chaste malayali women right. who read their ramayanam in the evening but they're also capable of having affairs on the side you know it was perfectly normal like people today you know and there was this one letter when i was working on my first book that i came across it was by this man called kerala varma velayutham ran who is considered the father of malayalam literature and the kalidas of kerala now of course he's been enshrined as the kalidas of kerala which means that you know he can't do anything wrong but i found this 1870s letter where he's basically talking about his uh, his fondness for marijuana and bhang now he was in his late 20s then and i thought well kids in their 20s are smoking up all the time now and this is the father of malayalam literature in his 20s in the 1870s doing the same thing and it is it doesn't trivialize his achievements the fact yeah. that he went on to become a great man it doesn't take away from that it merely reminds us that he was also a young man once upon a time and he also meddled in a number of things that you know many of us have experienced and i think that is you know that's an interesting way of looking at the past so it started at a personal level and then of course once i started investigating you know you discover that indian history is so rich and so fascinating and the people are so fascinating then it's very difficult to give up the subject actually because uh, manu was talking about you know women multiple husbands and stuff like that and i grew up in the same kind of family uh, which has um, a storytelling grandmother and i remember one of uh, you use the word husband more like a consort uh, one of the stories that my grandmother told me was that my great grandmother who had three consorts i think before she actually got married and apparently when she got fed up with whoever the current uh, the incumbent was the maid would take uh, the sandals and leave it outside his door so when he opened the door in the morning came out and saw her sandals there it was a signal for him to you know on your bike mate it kind of thing even better with royalty you know in the cochin royal family they uh, the, they were matrilineal so the princesses took husbands who were usually brahmins so the sons and the daughters were all members of the royal family but the husbands were brahmins from various exalted and not so exalted families so if they came from a not so exalted family their salary was 6 rupees per month and if they came from an exalted family they were paid 8 rupees a month so much so that finally in the 20th century one of these uh, husbands complain to the maharaja saying you can't have two rates of pay for the for men performing the same job so it was uh, it was, you know it's interesting that yeah. there were even salaries for this there's this prominent uh, nayar family called palyam in chendamangalam yeah. and they were extraordinarily wealthy controlled 41 temples some 12000 acres of land 11000 tenants you know the mulurkara fort the dutch palace in chendamangalam all of this was theirs so obviously now they're also nayars and uh, they have these nambudris and brahmins coming to marry them Now obviously the brahmins are a little awkward because caste is still an important thing so they're a little awkward about eating the salt of a non brahmin family so funnily enough the food of these brahmin husbands and all of that was cooked in a special building called ishwara seva mm. which was you're not feeding brahmins you're worshiping god it just so happens that they're there so our ancestors had various nice ways to paper over over these caste differences etc and to marry and well, carry on even without marriage and you know sometimes you got a salary sometimes you got ishwara seva yeah and uh, i want to get back to that caste system thing but before that uh, i know this whole event is around this latest book of yours which is a collection of uh, your essays um, which have appeared in various places but there are two books before that the ivory throne which you referred to and uh, rebel sultans um does that african proverb remember about until the lions learn to speak the story of the hunt will always favor the hunter uh one of the recurring themes in your uh, narratives and starting with the ivory throne is the prominence that uh, women most of them in conventional history have been reduced to footnotes and very very uh, minuscule footnotes actually one of those women say that akshmi bai is the uh, protagonist of uh, the ivory throne uh, did that happen sort of by happenstance or did you find that it was in the footnotes that you got the best of the stories how did, how did that come about Yeah I think at one level it was conscious in the sense that I'm not interested in retelling stories that say a dozen other people have done. So that's why for example even with the second book I'm not interested in the Mughals and I'm not interested right. in the Marathas because better people better historians have dealt with it. What I was interested in is you know bringing back into the limelight the story of the Deccan Sultanates who were neither Mughals they were enemies of the Mughals really they were largely Shia sultanates who paid homage to the Shah of Iran not to Delhi. 
and uh, they are the ones who set the stage where a Shivaji could emerge and the Marathas could emerge. The Marathas as a community formed because of the dynamics of the Deccani Sultanates. And it's just funny that they've been completely obscured and eclipsed by, by something that followed later. When they left behind, if you go to Bijapur, they've left behind monuments. One of the world's biggest domes is at the right. Gol Gumbad there. Uh, the kind of art that they've created. I mean, not all of it has survived, but whatever survived is just remarkable. One of the texts is this thing called the Nujum al Ulum, which was written in the in the 1570s, and that claims to be it's 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 a, I mean it's funny that it's all Persian, Arabic, etc. But it has a translation of a Sanskrit work called On Varshik Astrology, which nobody knows what that is anymore, but it sub survives in this in this in this text that was a, uh, written by one of the sultans. The art in it is just fascinating. There are these uh, there are these uh, Ruhanis or Tantric goddesses, and they completely obscure goddesses, Chalandhari, Shupagi, you know, they 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 not goddesses you and I have heard of, but they're Hindu Tantric goddesses. And the paintings are just remar remarkable. And one of them, you know, this lady's got all these two men by, by their hair and she's sort of flinging them around as though they were weightless. Uh, another has, you know, she's half white, half black. Another's wearing a, a garland of skulls. Like, it's just remarkable stuff. And it's just, like, once you start going into these stories, you realize that because they've been footnoted, we are doing ourselves a disservice. The other thing, of course, is women, which is that, you know, uh, all historians face one problem, which is that much of the history was written under royal patronage, mm -hmm. which may have meant that it was essentially at the core of it propaganda for various kings, and it was written by men. So even where women existed, they ended up with the short end of the stick. For instance, in the Deccan, there was this uh, Begum called Kunza Humayun, she appears in the book, yeah. and she was regent for her son for about six years. She was even in the time of her husband, she was very much a, a force at court. One of the reasons, and this is probably an apocryphal story, but the existence of that story tells you a lot about her influence, which is that uh, they say the final war against Vijayanagar was fought because the emperor of Vijayanagar sent her husband a, a letter demanding tribute. And among the heaps of diamonds and pearls or whatever he, he listed, he also said, I want the Begum's anklets. The idea being that it was to insult her. So she was a woman of some prominence. But her son, when he came to power, he was so insecure about the kind of uh, shadow he was essentially living under that he decided not only to expunge her from the records, but also to wipe her out of paintings. So there are miniature paintings where her husband appears, all the servants in the background appear, and this woman who was, in some of them, sitting in her husband's lap, sometimes next to him, she's been turned into a giant blob. And this blob still exists in these paintings. So there have been cases where men have actively written women out who they didn't like. And the other device that's often used is to simply turn, or, or simply, if not footnoting the woman, garland her and put her away on the pedestal of your choosing and your convenience. So for example, Mirabai, we, most people remember her as the great Krishna Bhakta, but she was also somebody who challenged Raj, Rajput patriarchy at the time. You know, she's, she said, I will not become a sati when her husband died, because she had no children, and her husband's brother didn't like the fact that this uh, previous, uh, you know, rival of his, at the end of the day, succession is rivalry between siblings. So he, the fact that she was alive was a little bit of a problem. So she refused to be a sati, but she also refused to be a widow in the conventional sense. She said, I'm going to meet whichever sages and saints and males that exist, and I'm interested in meeting. I'm going to go out for public events, etc. And that sort of thing, you know, that was a challenge to Rajput's order at that time. And eventually she gave it all up and walked out. Uh, even in the Lingayat tradition, Akka Mahadevi walks out. Now, these things you can either focus on the bhakti, but in focusing on the bhakti, we should never forget that the vocabulary may have been of devotion, but the ideas that were encapsulated in it were not always necessarily about God. They, it so happens that till about 300, 400 years ago, all ideas were expressed in the, in the vocabulary of religion and devotion. That doesn't mean they were only thinking about religion all day long. A lot of these women were protesting the kind of uh, you know, oppressions they had to face. The Jana, there's this Marathi uh, bhakti saint called Janabai, who was a kitchen maid in the, in the house of a more prominent male bhakti figure. And one of her poems begins with saying, God, won't you be a darling and kill my mother-in-law? God, won't you be a good God and kill my father-in-law while you're at it? And finally, she adds the sister-in-law to her roster of people to eliminate. And that's how the story, the, her poem ends. What is she saying? That this family, these family links, this domestic drudgery, this, this institution of family which is centered around the woman and her fertility, is something that seems to chain her, something that seems to pull her back. And she eventually, there's this other poem where she says that, you know, I will become a slut to find you. She's talking about finding God. But it's also about having the freedom to enter the marketplace, to go out there and not be stuck in a kitchen all day long. So these women were expressing radical ideas at the time. Because they were through the, the, the medium of God and devotion, 
it was very convenient for later men to sort of say, ah, Bhakti, so sweet. You know, she was singing bhajans all day long. Let's remember her for that and put her away nicely in a corner and put a garland on her and then forget conveniently about her. A little bit like we've done with Gandhiji also. You know, you put him on a, on a note and then you conveniently forget the very many things he said. Yeah, and uh, I mean, on that same note, one of the most fascinating stories in this one is that of the, uh, of, uh, the poet Muddupalani. Um, incredibly sensuous poetry, but what they were fighting about is whether she actually wrote those poems. So, they, they, in the 19th century, at one point, they were saying that the poems were written by Muddu Pillai because mm. <laughs> this was a poem in which uh, this is a woman not only talking. Sensuous poetry existed in Telugu literature, right? Plenty, but a lot of it was focused on men. Even when women wrote, it was about this king's virility and how many women he made love to and things like that. Here was a woman where talking Radha about. is her, her her protagonist. And Radha is a little upset and jealous because, you know, Krishna's married Ila, who apparently had bodies, a body as soft as bananas. And then uh, Radha gets very jealous and Krishna has to come and appease her. And uh, while this appeasement is going on, she insists on physical satisfaction. And there's this line where Krishna says, even when I tell her I'm tired, she hops on bed and begins the game of love, etc. It's about a woman's desire. It's about right. her physicality and her right to desire. Now, the thing is, at that time, she was this big gem in the Tanjaur court, etc. But... A century later, her reputation takes a, a complete hit. And these men are con comfortable pretending she's Muddu Pillai because they're okay with a man expressing these ideas. They, they can still somehow swallow the idea, the desire, physicality of women. Men can talk about it, but to think that a woman is talking about it was some sort of scandal. When Bangalore Nagaratnama finally published the work, it was banned for the longest time. It was after independence that the ban was lifted. But after that also, how many people have actually read it? You know, even in the late 80s when Susi Taru, etc. were looking for this manuscript, they were, lots of people were very scandalized saying, no, no, you know, how can you look for this kind of, uh, this kind of material? But that's our, our clouding, our prejudice, our flaw, not really that of the person who wrote the poetry. But yeah. that comes from a place of confidence also. She wrote at a time when this cultural insecurity didn't exist. If you look at the second uh, essay in the book, it's about that, uh, that play written by the Tanjaur yeah. Maratha king. Right. And it's so remarkable that to begin with, he's writing in Telugu, which is the court language in Tanjaur. His people he are all Tamilians and he himself is a Marathi speaker and his family apparently invented Sambar. As a South Indian, I, I hugely <laughs> resist this claim. But anyway, uh, so this is a man working in a multicultural order. His generals are all Afghans and Rajputs and people from all over. And he writes this poem called the Satidana Suramu which is basically, it's been translated into English uh, as take my wife, because that is the thrust of the, of the poem. It's this Brahmin called Morobatlu the Magnificent, who's on his way to a temple festival. And on the way there, he sees this very stunning, beautiful woman uh, on the road. So he says, oh, I must go woo her. Now his uh, disciple says, no, 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 Shastra, Dharma, think of subtle meanings of Vedic words, etc. Man says, no, 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 I don't want this eternal, insipid eternal bliss when I can have the bliss that comes with spending an evening with this lady. No, so he goes and starts okay. flirting with this lady, except she is an untouchable. She turns around and now she starts talking about philosophy and karma and artha and all of that, <laughs> trying to get this, this stalker to go away. And uh, you know, he's, not, he's not budging. So she says finally, no, no, but you can't have any dealings with me. We drink liquor, we eat beef, so we're not pure enough for you. So the man says, uh, we drink cow's milk and we worship the cow. You eat the whole cow, you must be purer than me. <laughs> now the thing is, this particular work was written in the early 18th century. And this was not merely written for private consumption. consumption it was performed yeah. in temples as a play, which meant large numbers of people who came for temple festivals were consuming this. The point I'm making is that in the early 18th century, so 1705 or so, we still had the cultural confidence to be able to parody caste, to parody social conventions, to turn things on its head and laugh at ourselves. It was written by a Maratha king. Today, if a writer were to write that in a play, you can imagine the kind of scandal it would cause. The difference is a deep sense of cultural insecurity. If women write about desire, no, 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 bad, terrible. You know, if we lampoon uh, this whole culture about beef and caste, etc., terrible, you know, horrible, etc., uh, etc. Et it all tells you more about our weaknesses and our failings as a society rather than our ancestors. But, uh, I mean, that's actually, I was going to bring up that caste thing because that's another one of those uh, recurring themes in your books, particularly the second and the third book, but it's also there to an extent in... Uh, the ivory throne, the, the Nairs versus the uh, Brahmins initially for hegemony, and then uh, the Aravas coming in, the Syrian Christians, the, the uh, Muslims. Uh, caste keeps recurring, and you just brought up the point about how a lot of how we today deal with some of these issues stems from our uncertainty. So from your understanding of history, of the timeline of history, 
when and where did that uncertainty start? Why did we, why did we get where we are right now, where you know, pretty much everything is, uh, where literally offense is weaponized and industrialized? Competitive offense taking. Yep. One of the things is also the internet, which is that you know, earlier, for example, there were these, what people call fringe ideas that existed in the fringe. Suddenly you have this, this, this network that connects the whole world, which meant that you may be fringe in your city, but hey, you found another fringe in another city, and suddenly you don't feel so much like a fringe. So there's that to begin with. But a lot of the insecurity comes, I think, from the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a blanket blaming on the British, which is too black and white, but the point is colonization was never merely about colonizing land. It was also about colonizing minds. It was also about reorienting the way we think. So, for example, in, in Kerala, and I touch upon this in the Ivory Throne, and I think a little bit in this uh, one of the essays here, it's about how in Kerala, breasts became such a major issue. Right. Because people walked about topless till the 1940s. The first Brahmin woman to wear a blouse in the 1920s was excommunicated. And it was the same for men. You couldn't wear a shirt and sit down for a sadhya. It wasn't allowed. You had to take it off, go take a dip in the pond. Only then were you allowed to sit down at your meal because the shirt was considered too foreign. So even women who didn't wear blouses, not queens, not princesses, nobody did. Of course, in royal circles, by the late 19th century, the blouse had made its appearance. But in the, in the more orthodox Cochin royal family, blouses were completely... You have color photographs of matriarchs of the Cochin royal family sitting pretty topless, which is why there aren't that many pictures on the internet of the Cochin queens. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's just a yeah. general thing. Great aristocratic families, Kodungalu Raja's family, they have these group photos of mothers, sons, brothers, everybody uniformly topless. It wasn't a big thing. Today, if I have to enter a temple in Kerala, I still have to take off my shirt. Back in the day, women also had to do, you know, they had right, to take yeah. off their upper cloth or whatever. But one of the reasons this changed was because the Victorians came in. And when you're in a position of power, your cultural morality, your culture gains a certain ascendancy. So suddenly, Malayali men would go, say, to study, uh, do a BA course in Madras or something, and they'd be lampooned, saying, oh, your mother, your women are all harlots, they're all marrying three, four men if they like, they're all walking around topless all the time, you know, there's something wrong with your culture, it's so primitive, this and that. And that starts causing a deep sense of insecurity among Malayali men. So you look at the J. Devika's research shows how, for example, the first magazines for women that came about in Kerala very openly said, we're not going to talk about politics and economics and all of that. We're going to talk about uh, things that energize the moral conscience, by which they, me they meant wear a blouse, listen to your husband, give him all your money so he can uh, manage. You be a nice pativrata in the kitchen, raise your kids. And, you know, this, this right. whole concept of a nuclear family came about. And uh, there's this wonderful anecdote, which I can't stop relating, is about Aubrey Menon, the writer who uh, his book was one of the first to be banned in India in the 1950s. It was a parody of the Ramayana. Nehru banned it, by the way, the great liberal. And uh, in this, uh, his, his story is that his mother is Irish. His father is a Menon from Kerala. Yeah. So the mother comes down to see the father's family and the Naya mother-in-law says, okay, I will now receive my new Irish daughter-in-law. And at this time, uh, a maid goes running to fetch her and then she comes running back saying, Are you, you can't see her, she's sitting with her breasts covered. And the mother-in-law says, if she's covering herself, she must be preparing for adultery. Because it, yeah. if you didn't, if you were a respectable woman, you had no reason to objectify any part of your body in that way. But if you felt you had to cover yourself, there's something wrong with you. That was the notion. In the 1860s, the Travanco Maharaja was told by the British resident that, you know, whenever I come to the palace, all these palace servants are walking about topless. You know, this is very uncivilized. So the Maharaja says, okay, palace maids start wearing blouses. They wear it because they can't disobey the Maharaja. But the first thing they do as soon as they exit the palace gate is to throw off the blouses and go home topless because they can't afford to be seen on the streets right. with blouses. So, you know, there are, the stories are there. It's just fascinating that this was about less than a century ago. That was the moral system that existed less than a century ago. But over a period of time, through education, through a certain Victorianized education. So, you know, Kerala has the highest amount of literacy, you know, highest uh, literacy rates for decades now. Uh, the women were all sent to school. My great-grandmother was going to school. Uh, it's funny though that they had to come back and every time they came home, they had to dip in the pond and then come in to yeah. be Shuddham because school, you don't know who you met. Of course, by my grandmother's time, they discovered a new device of Shuddham, which was to, my grandmother would come back. By then, seven kids, if everyone's dipping in and out of the pond, it's an inconvenience. So they came up with a new system where someone would hold up an old ceremonial umbrella, a maid would pour a bucket of water from the right. top and that was your bath. So, no, but the point is she was going to school. School was there. But through that same system, you, on the one hand, you're doing a great thing by sending all your girls to school, but that school system also brought in a certain patriarchy. Because suddenly through school textbooks, etc., women were taught about these energize your moral conscience, etc. Suddenly the blouse became like a thing. Uh, it picked up. And then now, of course, if you go, you know, you have in Kerala weddings, Naya weddings, they put sindurum on the, or sindur yeah. on the, on the forehead. 
which is funny because back in the day when you had the sambandham system of marriage when women could have multiple husbands how much sindur are you going to wear there was no sindur so what we think of as traditional can also change very quickly and that is what happened in kerala the fact is that the the women had a certain uh, kind of autonomy there for a very long time it changed because of the victorians and the way they Uh, looked at our culture and what they said was good and what they said was something to be ashamed about that sense of shame is also what leads to that cultural insecurity that still afflicts uh, very many people they will you know they'll say that ganapati was an example of uh, head transplant or whatever yep. but they won't actually engage with this maratha prince with this parody of the caste system now that is a very valid part of our history as well but that kind of thing we are now ashamed of because that we don't want we want sanitized clean things that are essentially what the missionaries and the british criticized our ancestors about and we are still trying to answer that in some way and i think that is a tragedy because if you are culturally confident you don't need to do that i mean a couple of things one when you were talking i realized how old i was because uh uh i mean i've had to take off my shirt before i sat down for a meal in my grandmother's <laughs> place so yeah um we were spared all that lucky you I mean you get to read about it we get to live it so um th- th- a related question to that is this whole thing of identity and it's it's right now roiling the country uh, you you made the point that you know a lot of our insecurities came when different moral systems came and sort of superseded the existing ones in our land uh today we are struggling with the question of identity uh it's begun to roil the country you have a sam and um uh, fairly soon the rest of the uh, rest of the thing right it leads to that uh, question of one of the things that happens when you read say this latest book which because the essay spans such a wide uh, arc of time and stuff like this it really makes you wonder what your essential identity is because you come across story after story after story of people who are from somewhere else and and you suddenly realize that you're from pretty much everywhere and the deeper you go down digging into your own roots you realize the identity is not as apparent as it seems to be on another card or whatever what what does your reading of history tell you about where this problem came from and why are we now struggling with a question that we never had a problem with all this time i think steps? earlier one of the things was that having multiple identities wasn't such a big thing because to begin with there was caste so right people here were quite used to very many identities existing around them what changes is the coming of the british now some people theorize that the british invented caste in some way which is completely untrue but what the british did do was they are the ones who first did these massive censuses of india Mm-hmm. suddenly you have notions of majority minority which didn't exist earlier now you live in say a village of 100 families some of some belong to one caste some belong to another some belong to another religion now there's no great difference between these because for a brahmin a dalit is equally alien as is a muslim for a dalit a brahmin uh, landlord is as alien as is uh, a muslim merchant you know there's a very different dynamic there but the coming of the british and this codifying of castes and this counting of people saying oh hold on you are all hindus this one homogenized identity which actually exists only on paper to this day you know there are there are temple rituals performed in one part of the country which would scandalize hindus in another part of the country the hinduism of kashmir is not the hinduism of orissa which is not the hinduism of kerala uh, you know there's there's so much diversity in it it's a cultural tradition it's a it's a civilizational thing rather than a victorianized or a, or a western concept of religion is very difficult to somehow attach to this category yeah. called the hindus uh so the consequence was all this counting suddenly led people to believe that hold on this is my identity do i belong in this box or do i belong in that box now sometimes people were very good at negotiating there are castes in the first census they were classed as shudras they made a big huff and a puff about it and by the next census they were upgraded to kshatriyas now the point is the british were suddenly categorizing everybody and based on that is british policy was tailored on the basis of that So for instance uh, if uh, you belong to a certain caste there are chances that you would get into certain jobs uh, more easily right. certain categories mattered more and more and therefore people wanted to fit into one or the other of these boxes at the same time there's also an emergence of nationalism and nationalism also even on the liberal side as well as the what became eventually hindutva this notion of uniting the majority community comes from there which is that hold on you've counted all of us we just realized that 80% is us and the remaining 20% is them then yeah. that creates a, a little bit of a, an initial identity thing there then you break the majority into several pieces again you have identities on the basis of caste the nayas in kerala are a very big example earlier there were very many sub castes officially 18 that was the original written down thing but in practice there are like families that made up a caste by themselves yeah 
So there is a, there's a family in, in a place called Parimala. The story of that family is that there used to be human sacrifice in that temple. One day a voice came out of the sanctum saying, spare this girl. And that girl and her descendants became owners of the temple, but they also formed a separate caste by themselves. Now, they're Nayas, but then they're not equal to any of the other Nayas. They're in a different category altogether. So the Naya reformers, what they did is they basically wanted to put an end to all the sub-castes to basically unite all the Nayas into one category. It's all about numbers at the end of the day. And we're still playing that number game. We're still playing this game of majority, minority, vote bank, this vote bank, that. And that is where it all begins. It begins with the idea of the census as a tool and an instrument, not merely to count people for the sake of it, but to count and categorize and tell you, you belong here and you belong there. And the people here may feel that, oh, we have a greater claim to this country than you over there in that other box. And that leads to, I mean, the more you, you start thinking in terms of your identity, the more you more attached you become to your box. Whereas all of history tells us that while there, there are civilizational links, there are broad ideas, there are umbrella concepts under which many people were uh, linked in, in different ways. For example, people say that oh, before the British came, there was no India mm -hmm. or there was no notion of this one place, which I disagree with to the extent that there was some civilizational sense of this space being connected. So, for example, you look any corner of the country, there are Brahmins. Now, the funny thing is they speak the same language, which is Sanskrit, or they studied the same language and they venerated the same texts. But, e but even that is not enough to claim that they were one group because mm -hmm. Malayali Brahmins, they're Kudumis in the front, the Tamil Brahmin will wear it at the, black, at the back. The Malayali woman, uh, Brahmin woman will go to her wedding in white munda and white clothes. For the Tamil Brahmin woman, that's a mark of widowhood. She'll never wear white till she becomes a widow. So there's just a line of hill separates these two communities. Right. But within that, they have, their, they have their own differences. But there was a sense of cultural uh, connection between these places, which again wasn't purely Hindu as we understand it now. There's something called the Mapula Ramayana or the Muslim Ramayana yeah. in Kerala. Uh, uh, most of it is now lost, but whatever they could salvage and get recorded from the final uh, you know, bards in the 1960s and 70s, they have, and it's fascinating because at one point when Shurpanakha propositions Ram, and Ram says, oh sorry, you know, I'm already married, can't, uh, she turns around and says, oh, but in the Sharia it says you could take another wife, and Ravan is treated as a Sultan in that. So there was, these epics exist every, everywhere. And the sacred geography of the epics has been applied everywhere. You go to any, every part of the country, you'll find some temple or the other that claims that this is where a feather from Lajatayu's wing landed. Right. This is where when, uh, you know, a limb of Kali or Sati uh, landed in one of these places. All of this is trying to create a pattern. But this isn't, this is part of a Sanskrit, what scholars call the Sanskrit cosmopolis, which is not restricted only to India. It exists yeah. in Southeast Asia also. Right. You go to a Vietnam and a Thailand, for example, they'll point at Hill saying that's where the Sanjeevani came from, this is where uh, Sita was kidnapped from, just as we go to Nasik and say, oh, this and Panchavati was where uh, Sita was kidnapped from. They have a spot of their own. Because that in that Sanskrit universe, everybody applied this geography of the epics to their own local landscape, by which they created a certain uh, commonality between them. A the homogeneity. Own, yeah, there was something that, that sort of linked them in some way. But was it nationalism in the conventional sense? No, because nationalism emerged only in the 18th century, even in Europe. The nation state emerges there, it's in, it's in the 18th century. It's after the French Revolution that they actually standardized French. And you see these trends in India as well. Hindi was standardized in the 19th century. In fact, into the 20th century. It was still not finished by the early 20th century. The Hindi Prachar Sabha, one of the things was about standardizing and propagating. You know, you, you find the same with other languages also. A lot of this happens in the last 100 and 150 years. And that is where the magic really lies. That is where a lot of what we today think is tradition and we sort of staunchly believe that this is tradition, it's never changed. Tradition is this timeless rock that we have to protect. It all comes from, frankly, not very long ago. Yeah, and uh, that, that bit about tradition, much of our traditions have been kind of invented to suit the political needs of the time, whether it is from the time of the kings or even the time of, well, the present day kings. Um, it, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was trying not to go there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the question I had was, you know that old one about history repeating first as tragedy, then as far as uh, reading the Ivory Throne, you realize that the uh, Tirvidangu royal family did their best to sort of uh, concoct a kind of version of a Hindu state, very clearly Hindu, and, and it was spelt out as a Hindu state, and they failed. Similarly, you have throughout all your three books, you have these experiments that, that uh, keep coming and they all resonate with what is happening today. Again, from the ivory throne, I remember this bit about the newspaper revolution and, and uh, the sense of unease it caused in the corridors of power. 
and you really think that you're reading about you know mm, the prime minister and you know, this, uh, this whole thing about patterns with the past is fascinating when i was doing some work on the peshwas uh, mm -hmm. police records from the late 18th century it's funny how much of about uh, how much of it is connected to adultery there's some connected to homosexuality all of that was happening even then there's for example a case of a woman who tried to murder her husband by crushing glass into the atta and feeding her husband these treacherous chapatis to sort of rip his throat a very inventive method Another was this case where a father-in-law tries to basically rape his daughter-in-law. And she, remember, marital rape was a crime in the Peshwa era. It right. still isn't in modern India, in right. present-day India, but they were okay with that concept. And the, the man's excuse was, no, 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 I wasn't trying to rape her. I was on the way to the bathroom and I tripped, tripped and fell on her. The funny thing is, a few years ago, there was this case of a Saudi diplomat in London who tried to rape somebody. And, so, and his yeah. defense was the exact same thing. I was on the way to the toilet and I, and I tripped. So when you read that news and then you read this 18th century uh, record of a man defending himself for the exact same way, you realize obviously men don't change, but the other thing is also <laughs> human beings don't change. But patterns repeat themselves and these patterns become more and more clear when you start looking at power. Because at the end of the day, what orders society? It's power and who controls it and how power is defined, how power is legitimized. And in this you see these recurring trends all the time. You know, kings in the past had this habit where they'd give grants and, and you know issue edicts, etc. where they'd say, this grant is valid till the sun and the moon endure. Now they themselves know that their own dynasty will not endure till the sun and the moon are there. They will at some point where there's a rise, there's a fall. But they always had to pretend that they were there forever because power was a very fickle mistress. It could easily take off one fine morning and you wouldn't realize that it had abandoned you till it was very late. And by then the wolves would have showed up already at your door. So power always had needed, hard power wasn't enough. What was needed with it was also legitimacy and a daily reinforcement of that combination. So the Travancore family, you realize, the founder of modern Travancore is this man called Martanda Varma. Initially begins as a prince ruling a backwater that nobody cared about in Kerala. The real drama was in Calicut, under right. the Zamorin of Calicut, who was you know, fighting battles with the Portuguese and the Dutch. And this prince grew up in this backwater. What he then does to create this Hindu state, ironically, is to get arms from the English East India Company. A Dutch uh, prisoner of war starts training his troops. He gets mercenaries from Tamil Nadu. And then he creates this Malayali Hindu state, as it were. And, but it's not merely hard power. He conquers half of Kerala, reaches the frontiers of Cochin, conquers all of that. But that's not enough. In his own kingdom, people who have been raised under other smaller kings earlier that he's now toppled, they keep calling him an invader. So he says, what do I need next? Legitimacy. So he does this uh, very fascinating thing where he goes to the Padmanabhaswamy temple in Trivandrum, uh, lays his sword in front of the deity there and says, I now surrender all my conquest to you. Hereafter, I will rule as Padmanabhadasa and this kingdom belongs to God. So till yesterday, you were, you were capable of criticizing the king as an invader and as a conqueror and as an outsider. But now you can't criticize the state because the state is God. God is the one who owns the kingdom. So if you criticize Travancore as a concept, you're criticizing God. Now, of course, a, mem a very senior member of the royal family told me off the record with a little giggle that it helps that Padmanabha Swami in the Trivandrum temple is in Yoga Nidra, with his eyes half shut, because then the king as his agent can basically get away with doing anything in his name. Uh, so, on the other hand, he, now he gets legitimacy through that. The other thing he needs to do is that he is merely first among equals till then. So while he was building this kingdom, his own nobles were trying to murder him pretty much every chance they got. Which meant that now he had to do something to sanctify royal blood. Royal blood had to be made special. So he uh, does this fascinating ritual, which has been done by several Indian kings. The Nayakas in Madura and Tanjavur, etc. did it. Uh, the Zamorin of Calicut did it once. His family did it for several times, except the last Maharaja in the 1920s, 30s. Uh, where they get a cow and they construct a golden model of the cow, a huge model where the man could go in and sit in the, in the, in the middle of the cow. And while this king, this aspiring legitimized king was sitting inside the cow, the Brahmins would pelt it with Gomutra and Pal and uh, your flowers, etc. and chant mantras of birth. And then the man would emerge from under the tail of the cow. Now he was suddenly a twice-born Kshatriya who could wear the sacred thread, descended from the sun and the moon and you know, claiming whatever he wanted. And now suddenly you couldn't touch it because his caste had been upgraded. Now only Brahmins could surround him. All his food had to be cooked by Brahmins. So his own people had to start keeping a distance. Then having elevated his blood in caste, getting himself an, a little bit of an upgrade, which you find even with the uh, prominent kings like Shivaji, for example, doing it. Yeah. He, by when he gets himself, himself to become Chhatrapati, they have to discover uh, a, a genealogy that connects him to the Shishodhyas in Rajputana, uh, whereas his grandfather was actually a, a very important figure, but very much a Maratha based in, in, in the Deccan. And the Marathas, even in the late 19th century, the Brahmins were refusing to consider them fully Kshatriyas. And it, it exists, there's something called the Vedokta controversy, etc. So 
first now he's legitimized himself his kingdom then he's increased his own the value of his own blood the next thing he does is he invents a protocol around the royal family because every day you have to reinforce the fact that these people are special how do you do that so there's a 12 volume palace manual which gives you prescriptions on how to sleep what time to wake up uh, you know every time these princesses got married their husbands they chose whichever husband they wanted then uh, the boys would be presented she could say i like that one then the priest job was to make sure the horoscopes matched otherwise his head was you know on the table uh, but what they also did was this man would be taken to the family priest who taught him how to make love and what not to do when you're making love to a princess that was the kind of tutoring that was given so the husbands were told a that you are not equal to your wives so for instance setu lakshmi bai's husband the great scandal of her of her late teens and her early 20s was when she started allowing her husband to drive in the same car as her and her uncle the maharaja sent a scandalized note saying your husband is your husband but he's also your subject he can't be seen sitting next to you because if he sits next to you it's a sign of equality uh, the husbands were only called consorts husband was a little bit uh, much for them it was consort was better uh you know when when there were feasts in the palace the maharani had four desserts her husband got two two they were not they were not allowed to die in the palace you know every time <coughs> death was around the corner the whole court would be lifted and they'd be taken elsewhere to die in an outhouse or somewhere far away because the palace is only for members of the royal family all the women are enjoying this <laughs> <laughs> no and the 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 you know they the maharani every time she entered and left trivandrum she had a 21 gun salute the husband only got a two gun rifle yep. salute basically uh you know oh, there was that whole trumpets and bugles oh, and that they had there. another rule they every time a member of, uh, exited or entered the palace they had to stand up the guards had to stand up right. blow the trumpet and play the state anthem so in the current titular maharani of travancore lives on richmond road in bangalore and she tells me how as kids they would often when they were playing in the garden every time the guards saw these poor kids they'd stand up and play the anthem <laughs> thinking that the kids were royalty so they had to do their job so you know finally the guards had to be told that when the children are in the garden you don't need to do this but this whole protocol was created around them where even the words that were used for them were of a highly artificial ornamental character so in malayalam when you and i wake up in the morning we do something called pallideka which is mm. to brush your teeth with the royal family it's called tirumutta velaka which is the cleaning of the royal pearls because with the royal family there is no brushing teeth when uh, when queens got pregnant pregnancy was for mortal women you right. know you only women of normal families got pregnant queens never got pregnant nor did they do such things as giving birth when a queen got pregnant the proclamation was tiruvair vanu the royal womb is occupied then when she delivered the royal womb is vacated that was the kind of thing. it sounds comical now but at that time this was constantly reinforcing the idea that these people are not special not in vocabulary not in the way they live not in the way they move around rukmini varma the current uh, titular maharani who's the eldest member of the family in her old childhood she was a 9 year old or 7 8 year old girl when she had to go for a uh, walk at the garden at 4 o'clock all her 7 or 8 maids would come then there were household guards on each side so two in front two on either side and two at the back so another eight added there and was somebody holding up a parasol so for this one 8 year old girl to go for a walk there was 15 16 people following her again trying to project the idea that this family is special yes, yes. nothing they do is normal when you die you don't die it's called nardening you finish yeah. ruling this kingdom now you're going to rule the heavenly kingdom that's the kind of vocabulary that's used and yet what happened her grandmother lived in a palace she setu lakshmi bai 300 servants who every time she came from the first floor to the ground floor the household guards would start bowing not six times not eight times exactly seven times ceiling to the floor that was the kind of protocol this hap- this is happening till 1947 by 1957 you have the communists in power and her own servants form a palace union and before you know it there's a communist flag on the palace as soon as power slipped away all it took was 10 years for all of this to change to change yeah. because power at the end of the day no matter how much you hold it it can slip away very quickly so this whole mythology you build around it also suddenly folds and falls down like a house of cards which is why you know people say oh this politicians do much pr well the politician needs that to survive you know he needs pr because every day he has to reinforce his specialness the fact that he's some sort of unique figure he's this great hero here to save us uh, you know on a, on a knight in shining armor on a white horse because frankly if he doesn't do that if we start thinking that he's just one of us familiarity breeds a certain contempt and that is dangerous for people in power but the lesson is that if you overdo it and no matter how much you do it at the end of the day if the real stuff is gone you're not really going to end up uh, on, 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 with a happy ending to your story and the mughals are a prime example of it you know by the death of aurangzeb all the real power started to go away what what happens their own governors start becoming independent kings yeah. this happens with the mughals it happened with the vijayanagar emperors where the nayaka kings who were their provincial governors start asserting their own independence it happened with the bamani sultans in the deccan everywhere you find that as soon as the main person has lost power initially there's this period where that person still controls legitimacy 
So the Mughal emperor's stamp was needed by the Marathas. For example, they would go and conquer a certain territory. And then they'd negotiate with the Mughals, said, okay, we'll give you so much if you give us a signature saying you're granting us that. You've actually gone and taken it. But the emperor has to sign off because there's legitimacy in that. But eventually, even that legitimacy finally is whittled down to nothing. So Shah Alam in the, in the, in the 1780s, 1782, I think, he's the emperor. And a man comes and, you know, you take custody of the emperor, basically you've got, he's your puppet after that. In this case, for the first time, not only were Mughal princesses raped, not only were the emperor's sons, princes of royal blood, descendants of Akbar, made to wear lehengas or whatever and start dancing for these tormentors, the emperor, this man sat on the emperor's chest and scooped out his eyes. Because by then, even his legitimacy didn't matter. Yet, the British kept them till the 1850s. Because even when the British came, for them, once it took Bengal, it was, it was war, it was aggression. But they needed the emperor to yeah, sort of somebody give a them a document and give them uh, a legal title over it. So this, hap this is happening now in our time with what the Congress party. There is a certain family, for example, it's there. On the one hand, it's almost like the party can't do without the family because they need the family there to keep all the factions together, etc. But in reality, it's just like the provincial governors of the Mughals and the Bahmanis and Vijayanagar. Everybody's created their faction, everyone's creating their own turf, and everybody's forgotten about the main emperor in charge. And the emperor has no way, no matter how well-meaning. Shah, Shah Alam tried a lot, and perhaps we can make an analogy with Rahul Gandhi trying a lot. But it's just yeah. that that real power that was there has slipped away, and now you, you're left with something of a shell where everybody inside is batting for themselves and you're stuck somehow pretending that this whole edifice still has a certain uh, meaning and it still has the capacity to come back. Whereas reality may be slightly different. That's what history tells you in terms of patterns and repetitions and rhymes. When uh, Manu was talking about the artificial creation of Hindutva and the uh, sort of escalating um, legitimacy given to the Hindutva kings and all that, I wanted to interrupt and say, um, any sort of relationship to any contemporary events or personalities is purely coincidental. But then uh, Manu went that way anyway. Uh, Manu, before I turn it over to the audience, I wanted to ask, uh, it's, it's kind of a two-part question. One of the things that's always bugged me is, um, I think at the Bangalore Lit Fest when you were talking, you talked about when you were researching Ivory Throne. You started your researches, if I remember correctly, in Britain, which had the archives of the East India Company and, and subsequently the Viceroy's. Uh, and that gave you a considerable chunk of the information that uh, you used. We keep talking heritage all the time, and we are so cavalier with our heritage that, uh, you know, even if accidentally our interest in our own heritage is sparked, we can't actually go around and find some of these documents. In fact, uh, several times when you read these stories in this book, one of the things is, where on earth did he go and find this? Uh, if you had the mandate, if you, if you could do it, how would you change the way history is taught and also how history is preserved? History is preserved is a, is a complicated thing because you often see uh, one of the things is resources. You know, Western countries, even now in decline, even in the UK where they're cutting funds, etc., you still find that they take care, take such solid care of their of their of their historical material. You know, manuscripts and old paper. I've touched 17th century paper into you know the thrill of touching something that you know this is like a royal grant given by the Queen of Travancore in 1694, and you're actually holding the thing. You know, you've got. Uh, you're, you're touching the same sheet of paper, but they preserve it really well, and they've got the resources for it. Here, I think at some level, we have an excess of history in the sense that anywhere you look, you can't walk five kilometers without running into some temple or some structure of some value, which, meant, which means that you know, we take it a little bit for granted. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's all around us. You go to the, the Qutub Shahi tombs in Golconda, the big tombs are now being restored, etc. Uh, privately, the Aga Khan Foundation is doing it. But there are these small structures on the way there, you'll find that people have constructed houses attached to them. So suddenly some little minor nobles, a little tomb is somebody's drawing room. You know, they put plastic chairs and they're living inside that. That's the level of, of you know, uh, our, our attitude towards uh, historical monuments and, and places. The other thing is often with archives you find that in the British Library, for example, or the, or the various libraries abroad, uh, including in America, there's a certain reliability. You put in an order, in an hour you'll get your thing if that's what's promised. Here sometimes, in the, I think it was in the Kerala State Archives that I had this experience where I looked at a file, returned it, went back the next day, requisitioned the same thing, and they come back saying, oh, the file's missing. Clearly, whoever collected it went and put it in the wrong place, or decided that I'll put it back tomorrow or something, and they didn't. And this is after hours of waiting. So you waited hours, you know, to get that thing back, and then they come and tell you, oh, it's missing. You, you see places where the water, the roof is leaking and the water's dripping onto files, and nobody, people are sitting and having chai, you know, two feet away from that. 
and it doesn't seem to affect them. And that, that creates a certain annoyance and frustration because the, on the one hand, you're sitting on so much material, but if you're not taking care of it, you know, there's, there's no great, I mean, what do you do? There's a little bit of a problem there. But that said, there are still places where plenty of history is available. One of the advantages of a place like the British Library, for example, is that because it's a copyright library, which, meant that, which means that everything that's published in the UK, by law, copies have to be sent to the British Library. So material spanning several generations, you know, obscure books written by Indians, often in Indian languages that you won't find here, you'll find it there. Because somehow it's ended up in their collections. There was this, uh, when I was working, I work a little bit on these princely states in general. There was this journal dedicated to the princely states called the Feudatory and Zamindari India. I looked and looked and looked and not in one library or archive in India could I find uh, the entire collection. But it exists in America of all places, at the University of California in Berkeley. They have the entire collection with them. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about them is if you email them and ask for a particular volume and if that's not there, they'll find a sister library that actually has it and tell you that library has it, go look there. And you know, now with digitizing, etc., you pay a fee, they'll scan it and send it to you. You don't even have to go there anymore. Because th that's one good thing about technology, and the more increasingly Indian archives are also doing this, they're starting to digitize things. And I think that may be one way to save a lot of this, uh, a lot of this heritage. So I think preserving it is, is it will probably, you know, we'll come around with technology. But the question is also, you know, we shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that Indian history is all records. Because that privileges people who could write that privileges certain castes over certain other castes that couldn't write, didn't have the privilege of literacy. So people often uh, say that, oh, you know, this, uh, where is, there's this character in Kerala called Nangihili. Nangihili oh. is this character where uh, one day the tax collectors come up and, you know, they ask her to pay something called Molakaram, which is called the breast tax. And she is poor, she's, you know, she's really not in a mood to deal with these people and their demands. What she does is she cuts off her breast, put it, puts it on a plantain leaf and says, there's your tax. You wanted a breast tax, there it is. Now the story as popularly told now is completely misunderstood. They say that the tax was a tax for the privilege of covering your breasts, which is not true. It was a poll tax and it was a poll tax charged on all lower caste people. For men it was called talakaram or head tax. For women, to distinguish them, it was called molakaram or breast tax. And you know what the logic is? The logic is, if you're a lower caste person, you're essentially bonded labor. You're, you're, you're practically a slave. So only certain parts of you are useful, which are parts that are necessary for physical labor. And uh, this is this I got from Jay Devika recently when I met her. She was explaining the, the origin of these taxes. And she was telling me how any part that had nothing to do with your physical labor was taxable. In the sense that you're a Dalit woman, you're supposed to work in the fields. Your breast is not really relevant there. It's, a, it's, it's productivity in a different sense for your kids. That has no relation to productivity. Uh, the, the farm, therefore, that will be taxed. For Dalit men, you don't need to use your head. You're using yes. your muscle. So, talakaram. So any moustaches, you know, if you had a, if you had facial hair, it was of a certain kind, it was taxed. You know, everything was taxed that had, that was not well essential in that sense. It was an oppressive caste-based tax that she was standing up to. Now people, especially on on the right wing on Twitter, will say, but there is no document on her, there is no record of Nangeli. And I'm like, where are the records on lower caste people anyway? They exist in folklore, they exist in song, they exist in the traditions of that community. Now the thing is, she may or may not have existed at a certain date. We have no exact date where we pinpoint and say for sure that this is when she actually lived. But the fact that this myth or this legend exists in this community for so long and it energizes the community in a certain way suggests that that legend has value. The question is not whether she exists. It's a little bit like that Padmavati thing. There is no evidence to show that there was a character called Padmavati. But the thing is, the existence of the legend is of historical interest because that legend is trying to communicate something. And this is what uh, scholars call songs of conquest and songs of yeah. existence. Which is not so. This notion is that you know either history was in Indian history it was all about religion it was all about religions fighting each other or people go to the other extreme and say it was all syncretic everybody was in a paradise of uh, happiness and sort of happily sort of dancing around with their various religions it's actually a mix of both in the sense that at elite levels there was a sense of religion there was a sense of us and them but it wasn't in it wasn't communal in the sense we think of today at mass level you find extreme sy syncretism. So Shivaji on the one hand says that I will establish Hindavi Swaraj, I will purge Persian from the Marathi language, I will create a new uh, Rajavevahar Kosha dictionary of Sanskrit words where you can, uh, with e examples of how you can replace uh, Persian words. He does all that because he's clear that he wants to create a new Hindu order that is classical and Brahminical in origin. Yet, his father's name was Shahji, his uncle's name was Sharifji. Now, why are they called Shahji and Sharifji? Because his grandparents couldn't have kids for a long time. They went to a Sufi saint called Shah Sharif. He blessed them and then these sons were born. So one was named Shah, the other was named Sharif. After a Muslim saint. This yeah. is Shivaji's own parents and grandparents, their generation. Because at the mass level, people were much more willing to 
engaged. They were if a holy man came, it didn't really matter whether he had a sacred thread or whether he was wearing a, a skull cap. The point was he was a holy man. People were willing to go and engage. When it came to kings, however, kings legitimized themselves how through religion. So, a Vijayanagar king will say on the one hand that, you know, I am here to uh, purge the earth of all the mlechas who have come to rule here, etc. But at the same time, you know, Vijayanagar people were wearing clothes inspired by Persian fashions. You know, there's this, uh, recently, in fact, on Twitter, there was this picture, a, a sketch of Krishna Devaraya based on his bronze in Tirupati. And one writer, Devdat Patnaik or somebody tweeted it saying, oh, look, he's wearing a, a Persian cap. And somebody said, no, how dare you call it a Persian cap, it's a mukutta or whatever. And they're all, and there's this huge hoo-ha being made about this sketch by somebody else. Now you look at the actual Tirupati bronze, you can clearly see there are folds and the, the way it's shaped. It's something that resembles a Turkish fez, that's the closest yes. parallel you can find now. <coughs> and it's not surprising because Vijayanagar Hampi sculpture shows plenty of evidence, evidence of yes. costumes and the, the fashions changing over certain periods. You go to the Lepakshi temple, the murals there show these exact gaps. In the bronze, he's got these two hanging strands in front. In the Lepakshi murals, you can see the, those colorful cloth uh, caps they're wearing with these hanging strands. So you compare all of this and you discover that they had no issues bringing in Persian, uh, you know, uh, uh, cultural influences because Persian was not seen as a religious thing. Just as the English language today is a soft power export from the UK, it is the language of the world. At that time, Persian, Persian was, was the language yeah. of the international world. Before that, in India, South, North India, South India, and Southeast Asia, Sanskrit was the language of internet. It was a trans-regional language. That's how the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, etc., went abroad because Sanskrit at elite le elite levels was spoken in very many places, not merely in India. That age of Sanskrit ended. Then you have the age of Persia, ka Persian coming in from the other side, and Persian doesn't have a religious connotation at the time because it. It was. It isn't Arabic. Arabic and the Quran, etc. You can make a religious connection, but the Persian language had a very different uh, heritage. It was and origin. more art and poetry. Yeah. So yeah. even when the Maharani of Travancore writes letters to the governor of the of Madras, the English governor of Madras in the early 19th century, she's writing in Persian because Persian was seen as the language of diplomacy. So it's not a question of either or. It's not. Some people will say Tipu Sultan, terrible man, went and demolished lots of temples. Other people say no, 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 gave grants to many temples. Not an either or. Same thing, different context, different behaviors. When you're conquering a land, you're going to be violent. He was admittedly abnormally violent when he was conquering lands. And that is fine. He's a conqueror there. In his own settled territories, he'd call Malayali Brahmins infidels, but he'd employ Kannadiga Brahmins in his government. The same infidels were occupying his government. Purnaya was inherited by the British from Tipu Sultan's court. And he was a big Brahmin. Yeah. Uh, in his settled territories, he'll give grants to temples. Because for him, there's no either or. Your settled territories are places for you to protect. When you're conquering, you will use religion and say, infidels, I will bash these temples, etc. You find uh, these early invaders, Mahmud of Gore, etc. In all the texts, they'll say, kill 20,000 infidels on a daily basis, etc., etc. Now, they, it's written in Persian, Arabic. These are the languages. What are they doing? They're trying to cater to a, an audience in the Islamic world. They're trying to cater to a caliph who's supposed to legitimize them, saying, ah, what a good Muslim you are. You've been killing infidels. Therefore, I will legitimize you. These texts are oriented towards them. In practice, the same Mahmud of Ghori, on his coins, he'll have Lakshmi inscribed. Because without the so-called infidel goddess, these people are not going to accept his coins. So he needs to continue both. That's why at the beginning of this new book, I talk about context. Yeah. Everything is contextual. There is no simple answer. There is no black and white. There is no simplistic way of looking at India's past. It is always connected to context, which makes it difficult to construct political grand narratives out of. So what's happened is history has become this bag of of raw materials for people, they'll pick and choose and legitimize an ideology. But in reality, if you start looking at history through its own terms and on its own terms and through the eyes of, its, of the historical figures who actually lived and worked at the time, you find that they didn't have this dichotomy we've constructed. Yes, Muslim kings considered or shaped their self-image in Islamic terms, but they also patronized Sanskrit and Ibrahim Adil Shah was a Shutsunni yeah. Muslim but called himself son of Saraswati and Ganapati, right. renamed his capital Vidyapur to honor Saraswati, uh, you know, spoke Marathi more fluently than he did Persian. But equally, he had an ancestor who was the opposite. There's, nobody's saying there weren't bigots. Nobody's saying that there weren't people who took religion to extreme levels. Then as today, these people existed. But the point is, politics was guided by what? The same things that guide politics even today. Greed, money, a quest for power. In that pursuit, you will use whatever you get to legitimize yourself. They lived in an age of religion, so they legitimized themselves with religion. We live in an age of nationalism, so some people legitimize themselves as nationalists. Some people say you are anti-national if you don't agree with them. It's all essentially at the end of the, of the day, the same thing that's happening again and again, merely in different contexts and slightly different forms. When Manu talked about uh, WhatsApp and history and stuff like that, I was very tempted to go down that uh, particular rabbit hole, but um, time. 
Um, we'll turn it over to the audience now for questions. Are the mics to go around or should I? Uh, uh, can I just make a couple of announcements? Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't already gotten your copy of The Courtesan, The Mahatma and The Italian Brahmin, you can get it right outside. Uh, Champaka has set up their pop-up bookstore. You can also check out the rest of their collection. Uh, when the mic is being passed around, I request you to please wait for the mic to come to you. We're live streaming this session and we want everything to be recorded. Uh, yeah, we can open the floor for questions. I was not privy to the earlier conversation, so the last, what you said just now. So is it the case, you said you'd love to, I don't want to use the word play to the gallery, but is it the case that there is no central theme which dictated some set of people doing certain actions? It's either this or that. You said everything is contextual. Yeah, I don't think there is one grand theme that motivated people. Uh, because the same people, you find them doing very many contradictory things, just like people today. You know, the recently Karnataka, for example, saw people switch parties, etc. The ease with which it happened. You know, on the one hand, till yesterday you were starting slogans where you said secularism, liberalism, whatever. And then suddenly you switched and gone over to the other side. This sort of human behavior isn't new. So, you know, one of the points I try to make is that that basic core human impulse, the way human beings behave, that doesn't change over time. At the same time, grand narratives, did they exist? People did try to construct them. So for example, the Vijayanagar kings called themselves Hindu Raya Surathrana, which is a Sanskritization where it says, Sultans among Hindu kings. So on the one hand, they are the first people to use the word Hindu and consciously apply it to themselves. Otherwise, Hindu was used by foreigners for people living in India. Now for the first time, Vijayanagar says, we are Hindu kings, which means they have a clear notion of the other people not being Hindus and them being Hindus. At the same time, they're also borrowing an Islamic title of Sultan, because for them, that's not a problem either. They're saying, we, you are sultans among Muslims, we are sultans among Hindu kings. That term Sultan was appropriated by them with great enthusiasm at the same time. Because for them, again, it wasn't one grand narrative dictating all their actions. The narrative was used to create or sculpt your self-image. As I said, kings, uh, you, you missed the earlier part perhaps, but I was talking about legitimacy and, legitimacy and kings and how kings needed legitimacy constantly. For that, religion came into great use for them. But the notion that there was a communal sort of understanding as we understand it today is a very recent concept. Because that comes from the censuses and the notion that XYZ people that amount to this particular number or this percentage of the population belong to this category. That is a very modern phenomenon, pretty much from the late 19th century. Earlier periods, it didn't work that way. And you, you find plenty of cases where, the, and the same case as I said, you know, you'll say one thing in your text, but you'll do the opposite. And a good historian also knows how to look at the texts in context. So example, there's this text called the Madura Vijaya, which is about how the Vijayanagar troops go into Madurai, uh, kick out the sultans of Madurai, and they reclaim Madurai. And it's a text where it talks about how you know, there was the blood of, uh, of, of cows in the streets, and Brahmins were being slaughtered, and we've come to resurrect the, you know, or, or put back in order this erstwhile Hindu city. Now the interesting thing is, there is a certain amount of truth, truth to it, but that's not the only truth. It is true that this is another set of Hindu kings coming and re-Hinduizing the place and starting worship again in the temples, etc. But at the same time, the text is also playing another role there. It is written in Sanskrit, so it's not intended for the masses, it's intended for the elites in Madurai and that region. Now, what is Vijayanagar at this time? It's a Telugu Kannada enterprise that's going into Tamil territory, which had its own Cholas and Pandyas, etc. And now they're claiming to be your emperors. So on the one hand, you're definitely, you know, you're, you're connecting on some Sanskritic plane that is in common between Madura and your Vijayanagar center. But on the other hand, the text is also saying that by making this Muslim Sultan who was here more foreign, you're making yourself a Kannadiga Telugu enterprise from outside look less foreign. You're legitimizing yourself in the eyes of these new people by saying, well, we may be Kannada and Telugu and not Tamils, but, you know, we've got this Sanskritic thing in common. So they highlighted that over there. Another time you find that, you know, the same Vijayanagar emperor sent an embassy to Portugal saying that, you know, will you send me a Portuguese princess uh, as a bride because I'll send you a Vijayanagar princess and you rule the seas and I will rule the, the peninsula and we'll have a grand alliance between ourselves. Their religion didn't come into the picture. The other thing you also find is also that uh, the metaphors that are used. So often when they're talking about Islamic kings, they don't use the word Muslims or Islamic, they use the word Turushka which was a racial term for the first Turks who came to India, where it was a racial concept, saying that these people are Turks who've come in. The religion as such was not what was amplified or highlighted at that time. 
And this Turushka thing goes to such a level where uh, you find that the, the, the king of Vijayanagar is called the Narapati or Lord of Men. The king of Orissa is called the Gajapati or the Lord of, of Elephants. And there is another third <coughs> metaphor that's often found in Sanskrit sources, which is Ashwapati or Lord of Horses. And when the Muslims came at the head of great cavalry, the Muslims are conveniently fitted into this metaphor. So you find at one point the Mughals are being called Ashwapatis in Sanskrit texts. You find the Vijayanagar emperor trying to uh, make an alliance with the Mughals to kick out the Bahmanis. There the Mughals are described as blessed by Kashi Vishwanath, uh, while uh, Vijayanagar is blessed by Tirupati and Gajapati in Orissa is blessed by the Jagannath temple. They're, they're fitting, the Muslims have come, their worldview is definitely Sanskritic, but they're finding ways to fit these people into their worldview. And you find the same with Muslim kings also. On the one hand, texts will say infidels, this, infidels, that. Golconda was ruled by Brahmins. The, the Sultan essentially by the end moved out of the this thing. So long as his Brahmin ministers delivered him his cash uh, every month, he didn't really make much of a complaint. The other thing is also, Muslim rulers who came, they came with an ideology of their own, certainly. They came with a self-image of their own and they stuck to it. But they also very early on realized that they had to negotiate with the people who actually lived there, on the ground. So, for example, Muslim kings and sultans were in these urban nodes in big cities. There was no way they could control the countryside unless they got people to cooperate with them. So, if you look at, uh, there's something called the Gadwal Samastan. It was one of the, the in the Andhra territories, it was under the Nizam of Hyderabad, ruled by a Hindu family. Originally, they were feudatories of the Kakatiya kings, 12th century, 13th century. Then the Delhi sultans come, they, the Kakatiyas fall, they become feudatories of the Delhi sultan. So Delhi sultan says, fine, you know, do your, live as you were so far, but you must send tribute to us now instead of the Kakatiyas. The Kakatiyas go, the Bahmani sultans come, they become vassals of the Bahmanis. Bahmanis go, the Qutub Shahs come, they become vassals of the Qutub Shahs. Qutub Shahs go and the Nizams of Hyderabad come as agents of the Mughals, they become vassals of the Nizams and they continue all the way till 1948. So that 1,000 square mile territory controlled by this Hindu family stayed for some 800, 900 years under the same family, even while the overlords kept sort of being toppled by somebody or the other and different religions came and left the picture. Because when they were negotiating power, people were much more practical. So they'll put out grand proclamations, they'll put out uh, self-images in, in Sanskrit versus Arabic and Persian, etc. But when it came to the business of actually ruling, they understood that they had to take people along and there was no other way to do it. And you find plenty of uh, evidence even in our day-to-day -day life. You look at the chief minister of Maharashtra, his name is Devendra Fadnavis, a proper Brahmin from Maharashtra, but Fadnavis is a Persian word. The Peshwas of Pune, super orthodox, custodians of the caste order, they sometimes upgraded caste, downgraded castes and all of that. They, uh, the term Peshwa is a Persian word. And, and this survives, the Marathi language was cleaned of Persian words only in the 19th century once the British did their censuses and said, oh Hindus, you guys are this and Muslims, you guys are that and you know, this is majority, minority. That's when a conscious effort was made to actually finally get rid of uh, as many Persian words as possible. To be fair, Shivaji had also tried. At that time it didn't work. The Persian came back uh, very easily because the world followed Persian at that time. So there is, there is no one grand narrative that, that, that sort of dictated the actions of any of these people. Their self-image they shaped on religious basis, but their actual negotiation of power and politics on the ground, they negotiated more practically depending on whoever they were dealing with. There was no one rule book that guided them. It depended entirely on who was on the other side and you know how you were sitting at a table. If you're on this side and the person on the other side is a Hindu, you will talk in great Sanskritic terms and come to some kind of arrangement. If it's a Muslim, you'll find other ways in Persian and you'll absorb, you'll give and you'll take. And you find this in literature, you find this in art, etc. as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manu. It was a very enriching session. Uh, what attracted me first was this Italian Brahmin concept, like you know. Uh, I would like to, to talk about that. And then, how is your book uh, uh, relevant? Uh, I'm, I'm asking a very simple question. I'm not using all my knowledge. Uh, how is it going to be really um, relevant in terms of reaching people today to make a uh, a legitimized living of an Indian born or acclimatized by living here for so many years as an Indian itself, instead of coming under the umbrella of uh, ownership of India, uh, how, how does it go into relevant? That is one. Number two, this education policy which has come up, 1919 education policy talks about uh, third standard should, uh, uh, students should go to a uh, all India exam or else he loses his uh, education opportunity for the rest of his life and then it's pushing back to the, uh, the old age-old uh, system of 
do your ancestral job and again the right to education is pulled away have you been able to touch that in your new book uh, thank you no I, i actually don't know about this particular rule in any detail so i won't comment on it uh, but the other thing is what i'm trying to do with the book is i'm not somebody who likes to sit with a stick and say i am right and you know you must all if you don't you you know you're not a friend of mine and you know you can't sit with a stick and shepherd people this way or that way what you can do and what i think is a mature thing to do is to persuade people there's you know there's no other way no ideas were built using merely sticks you know even the kings who had the sticks they needed stories at the end of the day to sort of woo people into believing that what they were saying was the truth but there is no the truth you know these things keep changing and i have no issues acknowledging that today i've written this book in 25 years it may be completely outdated more material may come to the fore uh, you know new perspectives may come to the fore and you have you need to have the modesty and humility to acknowledge that you know this can change for instance uh, in the in the victorian era or even in the first half of the 20th century people had no notion that there's something called the feminist perspective but today you can't deal with history unless you you know bring on board the feminist perspective because otherwise you're missing out a huge chunk tomorrow in in a few years there may be an lgbt perspective which we are oblivious to, to today but understanding heroes understanding people of the past understanding the events of the past through that perspective may lend a completely new angle to it so this is always going to keep changing so i'm never going to say i have the monopoly on the truth what i'm going to say is these this is the evidence that as it exists now this is what it shows us these are the stories across several themes that i've put together my three main themes one of the reasons i chose this title was to reflect my three main themes which is the courtesan refers to gender the other refers to caste which is the mahatma because i'm actually referring here to mahatma phule not to mahatma gandhi uh phule phule okay. yeah and finally the italian brahmin because the italian brahmin refers to the what i was saying earlier about human beings essentially at the end of the day uh, acting in in similar ways that core human impulse or doesn't really change human beings are human beings so you know that kerala or my story i told about the marijuana and the weed for example a man he was a human being you look at uh, various kings and various uh, figures in the past they were human beings jana bai where she says god kill my mother in law she's reflecting something that hasn't changed over very many centuries that sentiment still exists among people who may not want to murder their mother in laws but they don't necessarily get along with their mother in laws so mothers in law so there's there's you know there are there are parallels that you can find and i find human eccentricity a very interesting way of looking at the past through the eyes of the people who were there so the italian brahmin is this man who comes to india in 1604 he's born in italy in the 1570s he wants to convert people he's he's born into a very exalted family descended from a, a holy roman emperor has several popes in his family tree but he decides no no i want to become a missionary so he comes and uh, he gets here and he realizes first in goa that the only people converting because of portuguese efforts are lower caste people and he's like i don't want lower caste people i want the brahmins to convert now he orchestrates a transfer to this mission in madurai where a jesuit has been working for the last 15 years with a with a success rate that resulted in zero converts so 15 years zero converts now this man comes and he says i am not going to convert in the old way i am going to hinduize uh, my message so that the hindus will buy it so what does he do basically he wants brahmins so he starts wearing the sacred uh, the the saffron color so all his mundus and robes etc are saffron so he starts looking like a sanyasi one day he acquires the punul a sacred thread and starts behaving like a brahmin by the by a little bit uh, later he tells his colleague the other father in the in the business saying oh you know i have now become a brahmin i can't eat with you because you will defile my caste so the poor older jesuit is made to sit separately and eat because roberto has decided that he is now an italian brahmin in india he learns telugu he learns tamil he learns sanskrit starts debating brahmins on the vedas etc and eventually what he does is he says okay fine the, your vedas you keep the bible is the fifth veda and he starts preaching the bible as a lost veda and saying that he's a roman brahmin a lost sort of line of roman brahmins or whatever and this still i mean and of course very many people on the right say oh this was him he came as an agent of the west etc i don't think it happened in such a conscious sense that he came here saying i will infiltrate and i will i will do evil things or whatever it's just that he came here as an italian but very quickly he transformed himself essentially into a hindu version of the the catholic faith that he came here to preach and this isn't surprising you find this in kerala you know when the portuguese first came and they met the syrian christians they said all your churches belong to the pope and the syrian christians said who's the pope they had no idea who the pope was they were eastern orthodox christians they had nothing to do with the pope even today uh, yeah someone i know is getting married to a syrian christian boy they still have the exchange of garlands they you know in in orthodox kerala hindu families nambudri brahmin families in temples all the ghee that came to the temple any supply provisions that came to the temple you had to find a syrian christian to come and touch it before it was pure enough to enter the temple 
because without the touch of a Syrian Christian, nothing could be taken into the temple. You look at the oldest church, the churches, you look at the oldest mosques in Kerala. They built, they built by the same asharis or the same uh, masons and the same carpenters, etc., who built the temple. The result is what the mosques resemble temples and the temples resemble mosques. The oldest ones, like Tarithangadi in Kottayam, the Mishkal Palli in yeah. Calicut. You know, look at the oldest structures. The oldest mosque is supposed to have been erected in the, in the lifetime of the Prophet himself. Now, some people say that there's no evidence, uh, the building itself is not that old, so you can't confirm this. Even if you don't confirm it, two centuries later, by the mid-800s, the, the royal grants given by Hindu kings, the witnesses uh, were Muslims, they were signing in Arabic. So if by eight, the mid-800s, they were already influential to be witnessing royal grants. That meant they'd been there for some time, the Christians had been there for some time. In practice, in outward uh, appearance, there was nothing much to distinguish them from the other Hindus there. So they found a way to merge with the with the second. They essentially became another caste. And that's what this man was trying to do in the 17th century as well. For me, this, this quirk is really very interesting because, as I said, this notion that our ancestors were sitting with their spines erect and chanting mantras all, days, all day long, whereas in reality, they had desire. They were human beings. They made mistakes. They had you know, enough, enough adventures in their life. They did things like people even today. And that, for me, is an interesting way of looking at history. Because once you start going up this path, you discover that history comes alive in a much better way. You know, there's this, um, uh, even, even for example, the way we look at our epics now. So one of the essays in the book is about Shakuntala. And you know, what we have now learnt as the main story is the Kalidas Shakuntala, the Abhignanya Shakuntala. Now, in that you have the story where Shakuntala is there, this king comes one day while he's hunting, uh, says, oh lady of lovely thighs, lie with me or whatever. And Shakuntala says, oh no, she's very shy, etc. Her maids have to come and talk for her. Finally, they have this Gandharva Vivaha format, which is, makes up for lack of ritual and patience. Uh, you know, he says, gives her a ring, saying, you know, now when you come to me, you carry the ring or whatever. One day a sage comes, her head is in the clouds, the sage curses her, her maid, saying that this man will forget you. Uh, her maids all come running, saying, are you a power? She didn't mean it, etc. So they, he says, fine. You know, when the king sees the ring, he will remember everything again. Chakuntala goes, the ring gets lost, king doesn't recognize, she cries, she goes off. Uh, eventually, the king finds a ring via fish, etc. And that's how the story ends. The funny thing is, this is not the original Shakuntala. The original Shakuntala of the epics is a slightly different Shakuntala. There, when Dushanta comes to the ashram after a phenomenal hunt, there is, there's an entire list of animals he's killed on the way to Shakuntala. And he comes and meets her. He says, oh, you know, lady of, uh, this you buxom lady, lie with me, etc. Shakuntala says, fine, there are no maids. She's not some coy damsel in distress who can't talk. She talks directly to him. She says, fine, but my son must be your heir. So before this transaction happens, she extracts from him a promise. Her son will be the next king. She has this peculiar 36-month pregnancy, at the end of which the son is born, and she goes to the court. Again, in court, she's not talking through maids, she's not crying. She stands there and she asks the king to honor his, his pledge as he promised. Now this time, the king, there is no ring, there is no curse in the original story. The king deliberately lies. The king says things in his head that, you know, if uh, this woman walks, a stray woman walks into my court with a baby, uh, you know, if I start acknowledging that this was actually my doing, then what will my courtiers think of me? So he says, no, 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 you know, uh, there are birds that lay their eggs in other nests, don't try this trick with me, etc. Shakuntala doesn't cry and leave. She says that even without you, my son will be king of all three worlds. You rule the earth, I fly the skies. So she stands there with, with, with full of fury and she makes a statement there before anything else happens. Then, of course, there's a magical voice from the heavens that says, uh, you know, she's telling the truth, Dushanta, you better behave. So he says, fine, fine, I was lying for these reasons. And Shakuntala, I now forgive you because patriarchy is as old as any Indian tradition. That is the original Shakuntala. Now, why is it that we know the other Kalida Shakuntala more? There's a reason. Again, goes back to human quirk, which was a man called William Jones. William Jones in the late uh, 18th century was the first man to translate Shakuntala into English. And Shakuntala, or Shakuntala, the fatal ring, uh, became such a sensation, it was performed in London, it was performed in Germany on stage. It became a huge sensation for several years at the time. Uh, but the man, in doing the translation, he also sanitized it and brought his own moral lens to apply to the Shakuntala story. To begin with, there's a line, for example, where it talks about how Shakuntala is sad and how her face is sad, her shoulders are drooping and her breasts are sagging. Now, this man, when he translates, he keeps the shoulders and the face, but he expunges the breasts yes. from it because it's too uh, you know, problematic for his audience in, in Europe. This Shakuntala in English then comes back to us in our own textbooks, in our own uh, books, etc. And we start internalizing this Shakuntala as opposed to the earlier one. We also we haven't even internalized the full Kalidas Shakuntala properly. We will, we've internalized a sanitized, uh, chaster version of her as viewed by, a, by an Englishman, an English judge. He's the one who created this version of Shakuntala. 
he did it with the best of intentions william jones appears in one of the essays of the book he's the he's the main focus he came here and he was he fell in love with india he wanted to translate texts he established the asiatic society they're the ones who discovered that we had somebody called ashoka we had forgotten by then they're the ones who put together these inscriptions from different places and said hold on this is all one king they're the ones who connected sandra cortes of the greek records with chandragupta maurya so they did do a certain service there but in that process of translation a certain amount of politics also came into it that is where human quirk comes in because these people who did the translation the people who did the ruling the italian ramen reflects human quirk because even when we look at colonialism we now live in a time of colonialism equal to bad nationalism equal to good but if you look at vio chidambaram pillai story in the book it tells you how even within the nationalist struggle there were people who were left behind there were people in the time of swadeshi when most people were i don't know making bangles and doing charkha and things like that charkha came in gandhi ji but other forms of much more easy sort of swadeshi this man set up a shipping company a very very successful shipping venture till of course the british scuttled him uh, put him in jail on trumped up charges his entire business went bust from being offered lakhs of rupees in the 1910s for his business if he would sell it he ended up becoming a essentially an impoverished pauper he get nothing and the he, his legal uh, license was suspended and he was so pleased uh, that the judge restored it that he named his son voleshwaran after the judge wallace you know in the freedom struggle there are people who were left behind similarly on the british side you find that there were people who made a massive difference if you go to areas in the godavari belt that basin area all the irrigation was done at the behest of a man called uh, sir arthur cotton so arthur cotton was evangelical he came here believing that he was going to civilize india etc but even today on his birthday it's celebrated as an official jayanti by the government where farmers come and garland his apparently 3000 statues exist of him busts etc in different parts of that region they come and garland it and they do poojas and aartis etc of arthur cotton even today I got to the story because when I went, one of the Travancore residents was a man called C. W. E. Cotton. So I went to meet his nephew and get records of C. W. E. Cotton. He's the one who told me, "It's funny you're asking about this uncle. What about that uncle? He's the big one." That's when I discovered that this man was worshipped and venerated even today. Now he's an imperialist. He came here to civilize, but is he a bad man? You know, again, there's no black and white. There are people who came for various reasons. Some did more damage than they did good. Some people tried to do good, did a little bit of damage in the process. imperialism was bad but the people who operated it you know have interesting stories and that needs to be told a lot of people who came to india didn't come here saying we will rule india they came to escape criminal cases at home there were women who came here because they their reputations were tarnished at home so they thought if we come to india we'll escape our own uh, reputation the stories are fascinating queen victoria you know when she assumes the title of empress of india everyone thinks imperialist queen uh, assuming title of empress of india but if you look at the backroom negotiations that happened in britain A why did she want empress of india so desperately to begin with because her, her daughter was married to a german prince and the emperor's son and she knew her daughter would one day become an empress and she couldn't stand the idea of being outranked by her daughter so if her daughter was going to be an empress she had to be an empress that was motivation number 1 the other thing was at home she had no power the one place where the british government gave her some influence was foreign policy specific to india and and, and she got so carried away with it her proclamation of 1858 after the great rebellion was used by indians for anything like private property dispute someone would send her a petition saying property dispute you guarantee all our laws in your proclamation come and help us with this income tax was introduced in the 1860s and indians opposed it saying but victoria's proclamation she started getting so much from india and she she sort of and think of it this this quirky little grandmother who's getting so much attention suddenly from india and she's completely thrilled she's her appetite for india related stuff is so high that the british government starts censoring her mail the palace office keeps sending stuff back to india to the viceroy saying that don't let this reach the queen's eyes because she's got this appetite for india related things parliament didn't want to give her empress of india as a title that um, that the act that legitimized this passed with a very narrow majority in the british parliament because they said we are a democracy a queen a queen of england cannot have uh, imperial pretensions so the final uh, agreement was she would be empress of india but queen in her own country she was never called empress victoria back home she was merely empress of india so if you look at all of this you look at this one lady and suddenly you look at you get a new perspective of how the imperial system also operated parliament had its own process then of course here it had another process you look at a william jones and you look at how they affected scholarship how they translated indian texts you, as you look at different characters different facets come alive and that i think is is important to understand not only their personal journeys which we can learn plenty about from but also the the way they negotiated challenges in their own time the final uh, essay with which the book not uh, the, the the final thing is an afterward but just before that there's an essay called uh, what if gandhi had lived yeah. there are three speculative essays in the book slightly naughty of me to do that because most people know that uh, speculation is slippery but the idea was you know gandhi ji once expressed in writing his desire to live for 125 years 
which meant he would have died around 1994. Now, Zimbabwe. the essay does two, three things. First, I try to see how would he have responded to various political events. Now, this is a very quirky man. He wrote, you know, all kinds of op-eds and carried out all kinds of experiments. Now, if he had lived till 1994, how would he have reacted to various events? For example, uh, the emergency. Would he have told Indira Gandhi, emergency, I'm going to fast unto death? Would she have said, fine, you know, go ahead and fast? Uh, Babri Masjid, how would he have reacted to Babri Masjid? You know, would he have become an international problem for Jinnah because at one point he was threatening to go and live in Pakistan for the rest of his life? Uh, what, but the other thing I also try to do through that is also look at essentially our own hypocrisy. Because as I said earlier, we put him on banknotes, etc. We've conveniently forgotten the things he wanted uh, done. He didn't like this industrial uh, you know, appetite that Nehru had, for example. It's very likely if he, if he had lived, he would have ended up arguing with them. Would he then have descended into a cranky old man writing about his bowel movements in newspapers because he also did that? Would he have become just that? Would he have been completely forgotten like people forgot Anna Hazare? You know, 2011 people were saying the new Gandhi, the new Messiah, this, that. Where is this man now? Because society is very quick to forget. Once you've milked that man for what he got, what he, what he could offer, it's very easy to forget people. Already by the late 1930s when the Congress party was forming governments in eight Indian provinces, it's fascinating if you look at the records, already you have complaints of nepotism, you have complaints of corruption yep. from the late 1930s. Indian, Indians were in government from 19, from ni after the 1935 constitution, from 1937-38 they were in power. They were already ruling. So it's not like we didn't collaborate with the British. I mean, there is a certain amount of collaboration. And again in this black and white, if you black and white as it, lots of statesmen the Indian army we inherited from the British. Why is it that we don't study much about India's contributions in the Second and the First World War? Because we're embarrassed because they were fighting for a foreign king. The same brigadiers and colonels and captains and soldiers, one fine day they were soldiers of the British Indian army, the British left, the next day they become members of the Indian army. It's the same people. But we've nicely forgotten their record pre-1947 because to acknowledge that would be to acknowledge that the same people essentially served the previous order and then started serving the independent uh, India's uh, government as well. But their contributions were real. And shouldn't we now in 2019 be able to move beyond this insecurity of, of uh, you know, uh, who people served back in the day? Because look at it, they helped defeat fascism in the 1940s. That is something to be proud of. That is the kind of resources, money, human uh, loss that India suffered at the time. It's not small. These are, these are, there are staggering uh, you know, losses. There are wonderful tales to be told. There are researchers who found letters these soldiers would write <coughs> from Europe to their uh, wives and mothers back home where they were missing it. They were missing home. They were missing their chapatis and their food and things like that. And you know, it tells you so much about them. They're, they're nameless. You know, we know about generals and all, but the, the soldier who's fighting in a cold country he's never seen before, and for a foreign king, what was going through his head? So if you start going through people like these human beings, the Italian Brahmin and what he represents in the book, you become a little more sympathetic to people and you don't judge them as much as you would want to. Because we live in an age where you're judging everybody left, right and center. Someone has an opinion opposite to yours, you judge that person and say, complete sangi, you know, lost cause. Things like that. It's not, I think there is space for conversation. If people say something, they're coming from somewhere. That, if you understand, there is space to sort of persuade, negotiate. And that's what I'm trying to do with the book, which is that it's not a sermon. It's not a lecture series where I'm saying, you're wrong, this is how it was done, this is the right thing. Merely highlighting the stories across three themes, I think, gives enough order for people to think. And once you've got them thinking, the rest let them you know, come to their own conclusions. Thank you. That's a very long answer, but... <laughs> no. Uh, um, I haven't read your book yet, but uh, from our conversation, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you think your book might end up uh, glorifying Brahmins and Nayars and uh, just further uh, driving the caste discrimination that's prevalent in Kerala contrary, without intending to? On the contrary, actually, because this book has more about Bhakti saints and people who challenge the Brahminical order rather than uh, Brahmins and Nayars. This particular book doesn't have it. The first book, yeah. which uh, Ivory Throne, mm -hmm. that unfortunately... You, the Syrian Christians and the Iravas appear, and I talk about social movements essentially destabilizing the court, um, which is the irony, right? They, they created this Hindu state with a very Brahminical sense in their mind. And what did it lead to, eventually? Bloodshed and the rise of communism. The, the irony is just staring people in the face. So I was interested in the power structure that existed in Travancore, and there, there you find a lot of Brahminical influence and the Nayas, but it doesn't glorify them. It looks at it in a fairly critical sense. It looks at how Victorian morality changed things. It looks at how women lost a lot of their autonomy. It looks at how uh, you know, the, the dominance of Brahmins was challenged 
by the other caste first by the nayars then the dominance of the nayars was was challenged by the iravas who were uh, further down the caste ladder who in turn would not give up their privilege over the people who are further lower than them that's how the caste thing function right everybody hates their oppressor but they want to preserve their privilege to oppress the person under them so there there is some of that so it's not i don't think there's risk of glorifying uh, the only person who vaguely is glorified in the book is the protagonist which is setu lakshmi by the last maharani partly because she was footnoted forgotten completely and her work did not receive due attention so if there is a slight bias it's in her favor as an individual rather than the the royal order the order is something i think i i lampoon in a certain way by merely looking at it in a critical sense and you realize that you know that upset lots of people in trivandrum in kerala but otherwise i don't think it glorifies any of that i have three questions basically one is that now the very long answer for me It's not really right or wrong. It's simply think. I mean, it's just basically saying what you often think is your no- notion of the past is not necessarily what it is. You know, sort of uh, ponder about it. Uh, was there a intent to use this storytelling as a mode to get a point across? Or uh, and I have another question, which is basically, uh, so whatever we get, or whatever the history we read, or whatever the articles we read right now, is basically uh, filtered in a way to fit a bigger agenda. Like you said in Aubrey Menon's case, the book is bad. I read the book and one of the chapters in the book states the chapter title is Sita's Rape. I don't think we as a community can, in, we have the intake of such something that heavy. Do you think that by giving someone such filtered data, you are actually curbing them more to think? No, see, at some level, as I said earlier, everybody... No historian is completely objective. You can't be. If you're a human being, objectivity is something you aspire to. It's not a confirmed quality in anybody. Now, I have been raised in a certain way. I think in a certain way. No matter how much I try, certain filters, certain lenses I can get rid of, but certain even I won't know exist. But they'll be there. So, which is why that's the good thing about history, right? So long as people don't start abusing each other as they do on Twitter. See, if if you've written a bad book, someone will write a counter to it. You know, the process is there. Every 10 years, new material will come to the fore. A new light will be shed on the same topic, and that happens all the time with history. The thing is keeping the space open for that, and acknowledging very clearly that you can try to be uh, as objective as possible. But at the end of the day, at, in the best case scenario, you only succeed 95%. That 5% bias will make its way one way or the other. The other thing on agendas is, yeah, I mean, sadly, we live in a in a time where you know all a politicians always need. a uh, history for their for their raw material look at the last elections you know one party is saying over oh, 70 years these people didn't do anything they're talking history essentially they're highlighting that these these things were went wrong in 70 years the other party says but we are the ones who brought you independence at a certain time they are also channel channeling history they're using one set of stories from history to legitimize their present day preoccupations just as the other side is doing the same it's the exact same thing frankly getting away from it is difficult because even I mean, anybody in power at any time in history has always done this earlier they used to milk scriptures for uh, sanskritic rituals and all kinds of things to sort of legitimize themselves now they milk history it's just the it's just the way the world works the point then is to read as much as as widely as possible and as you read more and more widely your mind opens up and you can reach your own conclusions for example uh, you know there's this lampooning of savarkar over his mercy petitions which he which he wrote when he was in prison Now, if you look at the accumulated period, it, I'm not I'm not checked this myself, but apparently Savarkar spent the maximum number of years in prison in comparison to others. Now, the other thing is, once you start reading about that phase, there there are two biographies that have come out now: one by Vibhav Purandare, one by Vikram Sampath. Now, they may bring their own filters to it, but if you look at the data, now this man goes into prison at some 60 something kilos, and within like a year, he's 43 kilos. So that tells you that it wasn't some pleasure trip. There was clearly something going on over there that really caused 
uh, issues. The, the number of suicides that were happening there, people attempting suicide that was happening in that particular prison. There is even one angle which says that, so before Savarkar is imprisoned, he's a great champion of Hindu-Muslim unity. You read his book on the 1857 rebellion, it, it praises the Mughal emperor's proclamation. It says Hindus and Muslims are children of the same mother, their brothers, things like that, constantly, all over the place. Jawaharlal Nehru praised that book. You know, Gandhiji was fond of that book, because that book seemed to be to speak to everybody at that time. By the time he comes out, his views have changed completely. One theory says that it was because his jailers were Muslims and they were so sadistic and it was such a traumatizing experience for them, for him, that he turned it around and somehow, you know, that's where he started thinking in, in, in more sort of uh, polarized, in, in, in a more polarized sense and, and way. So, unless you understand the man, how are you going to understand the ideology he created? We can sit in lampoon and we can laugh, ha ha ha, mercy petition, but we weren't there. We don't know, we know his weight reduced, we know he suffered something there. Even if you don't agree with Hindutva, you need to understand the man who wrote and created this particular concept. For that, you have to go there with a certain amount of openness in your mind, saying, I'm not going to judge, I'm going to understand this person on his own terms and see what I feel. I think once you do that, you can form a more rounded, well-rounded opinion on lots of things. And as I said, I'm very uncomfortable with judging these historical figures. I mean, there's, there's two essays on Savarkar in this book. One is when he came up with this rather bizarre idea where he said, uh, uh, Gandhiji was asked by a journalist saying, you know, to keep, prevent partition or something, uh, would you allow a Muslim ruler in India? So he said, sure, let the Nizam of Hyderabad become the emperor of India. If, it be, if it, tomorrow we, the British were to leave, we'll have that order. And Sarkar gets very upset, this is around 1940. And he says, no, 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 how can the Nizam of Hyderabad be the emperor? The Hindu princely states are the pillars and the, uh, the king of Nepal will be the, the emperor of India. And he presents this huge scenario where the king of Nepal comes down from the hills with his armies and the Hindu princes come go with their armies and they liberate India, etc. Frankly, that if you read that article, it's pretty cuckoo. Like nobody has ever, I mean, to think that the Nepalese emperor as, as, as India's ruler was a, was a good idea at any point is just fascinating. Also, most of the princes were happily partying away in casinos and, and gambling abroad in Europe or marrying, collecting wives. There was one Maharaja who was called his exhausted highness because he had 300 wives. That was the kind of lives they, most of them were leading, not all, most of them. So it's funny that he even thought they were reliable partners in some sort of nation building exercise. But he's written that. So, you know, there's a little comical thing there. The other essay is about how his jumping off the ship in Marseille, where he tries to escape from a ship on his way back to India where, when he's arrested, leads to a diplomatic spat between Britain and France. Now, that is fascinating. Savarkar is frankly just a minor point in that story because once he does the jumping, he gets on shore, tries to run, they capture him, take him back. Now, the story really is, what does that lead to between Britain and France? Because once he's put on the ship and the ship sails off, the French authorities sit up saying, hold on, he stepped on French territory, so he's technically entitled to asylum, or at least to ask for asylum. And he had told one of the people who were the French cops who were there, that I won't take me to a magistrate. He had said something along those lines, which meant he was intending to ask for asylum. So the French said, no, 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 he has to be brought back. The British said, absolutely not. Funnily enough, the person who was in, in favor of sending him back was a man called Winston Churchill who said, fine, let a petty criminal escape. For our better relations with France, it's important to uh, allow this. But the Indian authorities said, absolutely not, we can't let him go. So he came back, then somebody suggested a middle way where they said, uh, let's do this, let's put Shavarkar, Shavarkar on a ship, take him back to French territory, sign all the papers, come back to Britain with the same ship. So he gets a little you know, halfway tour of the world, just to sort of land again on French territory, do it properly and then go back. Finally, it goes to the international courts for arbitration. And that's where Britain finally carries the day. So this man, man's one act like that had international repercussions between France and England. And I thought that was a fascinating little nugget of information that goes beyond the usual hackneyed stories about Savarkar and what he did, etc., etc. But the point is, read widely, read as much as possible without judgment. Then your, your eyes are opened a little bit more and you can form your own conclusions, especially at a time when everybody is dividing and saying that this is right and that is wrong. Never take any of that at face value. Choose for yourself. And I think we have the space even now in this country to do that. And unless we keep using that space, you know, there's no point complaining when it goes. So it's important that we use all these uh, privileges as we have today. And, you know, uh, don't just, you know, get carried away with the debates that are happening online, etc. And because you brought up Sita and you're not studying in JNU, read A.K. Ramanujam's essay. And then start exploring some of those uh, Ramayans. There's one, for instance, in in a tribal uh, language, um, the area is Orissa, where Sita is Ravana's daughter. Yeah, and it is a love affair between Sita and Rama that gets Ravana pissed Angry. off. And yeah, another so, she's uh, Rama's sister in another yeah, one. Yeah. 
In another one, she's not Ravan's daughter, but she's Mandodri's daughter. Ravan had kept all the blood of various sages. He sacrificed some you know, very powerful blood in a, in a little pot and told her, you know, you better keep this safe. Uh, Mandodri thinks, wow, you know, such power in a pot, I'm going to drink it. And then she drinks it and she discovers she's pregnant. And then she says, oops, now what do I do with this child? So then she goes and hides the child and that's how Sita's father, King Janaka, uh, discovers Sita in the earth. Where, because that's where Mandodari has left her. So that's why Mandodari's conundrum when Ravana kidnaps her is, oops, you know, my, my <laughs> husband is lusting after my daughter. So there's that version. There's one where they're siblings. Yeah. The, the versions are endless. And even the detail, as I mentioned, that Muslim Ramayana. 300 is just well, a, 300 is, a casual number. Yeah, it's just an off, off the top number. There's... And remember, codification is important. This is versions that we have codified. As I said, that Mapla Muslim Ramayana in Kerala was not codified for the longest time. Most of it is lost. It's only what survived in the 1960s and 70s, the last singer they somehow found. And he's the one who gave them what survived. And that much has been codified, but so much is lost. So imagine, before we started codifying this, how much we've actually lost across uh, the country in so many uh, areas and on so many topics. So can we say that you picked up the stories uh, from history and uh, present it to us or represent it to us or modified them or how historically close are... No, no, everything comes from some solid sources as they exist at the moment. Sources, you know, new sources may come to light tomorrow, then, you know, new angles will come. But all of this is from, you know, fairly academic sources. So the Savarkar one, for example, is uh, direct archival material that I found on this international case, this court case. Uh, the, the other one, uh, where there's one on the Vellore mutiny, that comes out of a parliamentary report that the British ordered. It's a fascinating story because in Vellore, uh, the British, uh, the, the in Indian troops in Vellore at the garrison, they mutinied against the British and the story is, I mean, the, the way it happened was that the British had meddled with their uniform. They said all the men have to basically sport the same kind of moustache and they have to start wearing the same hat. And they didn't realize that in India, your costume mattered because costume was a mark of caste and custom. So if a one man twirls his moustache this way, that's a mark of his caste. It's a caste privilege. If you tell him to twirl it this way, he thinks he's losing caste. If you start telling them they can't wear their turbans, everyone has different turbans. Everyone has different ways of winding it around their head. Now suddenly they have to start looking the same. They are, they are under the impression that they are all secretly being converted to Christianity. That's why they mutiny. And the British are so uh, embarrassed that it was a simple matter of uniforms and moustaches that caused uh, an entire mutiny in Vellore that they practically concoct a conspiracy and say Tipu Sultan's family, they caused this mutiny. <laughs> this comes out and you know, yeah. you, the parliamentary report from the time in London exists and you, know, you find fascinating details there. Some of it is from, uh, I don't read Telugu, I can only do Marathi, Hindi and Malayalam. But um, there's Telugu literature, where, which has been nicely translated by David Shulman and V.N. Rao and people like that. The, the riches that you find in a, in a volume like that, this, the sheer wealth of information there. Because history is no longer merely about looking at the records. You look at the literature, you look at the architecture, you look at what the lower castes were doing who have no records, and you look at the records. Only then do you have something that vaguely resembles the big picture, the overall truth as it were. Even then, it's not the full truth. So I made an attempt to look at all these things as far as possible in my books. But, you know, you always try. You can never guarantee a 100% uh, result. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I was wondering if you could throw some light on uh, how the temple in Trishur has come to uh, acquire this clout and influence. And specifically, the role of elephants uh, in Trishur. Hello. Uh, 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 hmm. That, I, again, I, from, I don't know much about it, but I think it's 18th century again. Because uh, you find often that donations to temples, uh, inventing new rituals in temples were things new kings usually did. And sometimes it's funny that, so in, um, uh, in Tanjavur, for example, you know, when the Nayakas were there, they claimed to be you know, heirs of the Cholas, for example. Then when the, when the Marathas came to rule, they were from Maharashtra, they were Marathi speaking, but they also called themselves lords of the Chola country and tried to connect themselves to an older Chola thing. And they also made their own carvings and started inscribing their own names into the, into the temple, etc. They created their own bits of art and music and changed certain customs in that temple. So I'm assuming it's a similar pattern where a certain powerful king comes, he feels uh, the need to sort of, uh, you know, create a certain ritual and a new practice around himself and his family in order to again legitimize themselves and connect, have a strong connection between them. I know more about the Padmanabha Swami temple, not so much about the Trishur temple. But uh, Manu made the point that most of these things are power, politics and money. And uh, if you're really interested in what happened in the Trishur thing, look up the story of Shaktan Tamburan and also the story of how the same Puram actually was never in Trishur. Uh, the legend is that on one of those occasions, 
elephants uh, used to go in procession from all surrounding temples. Um, and on one of those occasions, because of rain, some of these processions couldn't actually reach the destination and they were stopped. So Shaktun Tambran then says, okay, fine, if they don't want you, then we want you. And he made Trishur, the Puram. And because he was a king, he was striving for power, for fame and all that. He blocked all the other processions and insisted that they all come to Trishu, which made Puram. The, the changes, big. how these things change is remarkable in Trivandrum. Even today when they have the Arat in the Padmanabha Swami temple, the Trivandrum airport shuts down for three hours. Yeah. No flights allowed because the god has to pass through that route, through the runway really, to get to the sea to, uh, to, to take his ritual bath. In, uh, in, in Shaburimala, there's, you know, earlier there were certain tribal families that had certain rights mm. in that temple. Now really? they don't exist. And it's not that old. About 60 years ago is when their rights were terminated. When the rights of the Nirava family in the temple were terminated. So the Brahmin family's rights are intact. But the other castes and tribals who are there, their rituals have been Brahminized. And the Brahmins themselves are doing it. So there's that kind of change. In my ancestral village, there's these what we call Pallivalaka. These big uh, processions, these rathas that these men pull. And you know, once a railway track came there and these, these electric poles came up, it was very difficult to move the rathas from one side to the other. So that became the norm. The rathas would come till there and the other rathas would come on to this side. And that's about it. They don't actually meet anymore. But, you know, they adjust and they move on. And that's, and I'll end perhaps because people are get, it's getting late and people are getting restless. But I'll end with the final story which appears, I think, as I say, three or four in the book. Which is the story of a Muslim princess in a Hindu temple called Tuluka Nachyar. Actually, in two temples, in Melkote and in Sriranga, where uh, the story goes that, and this is in the Koyla River, the temple chronicles. The story goes that uh, the sultans or the armies from Delhi invaded the Muslims and they sacked the Sri Rangam temple. And the sacking is very interesting because in some temples they were very clever. They built a decoy wall. So they put the actual image behind the wall, construct a fake wall. Knowing that when invaders come, they can take a pretend statue while the original god sits in the background. But in Sri Rangam, they took the idol away. I think the processional idol of the deity. And the story goes that they took it back to Delhi. A female bhakta, who's since been called Pintodarnavali, she who followed or she who gave pursuit. She goes all the way to Delhi, discovers where they've kept this statue, comes all the way back to Sri Rangam in the south, tells these bhaktas uh, that, you know, look, I know where your god is, you better come with me. So 60 bhaktas go with her to Delhi, where they dance and sing for the Sultan of Delhi. And the Sultan, as in Hindu epic, says, ah, I'm pleased with you, I will give you a boon. And, you know, they say, fine, you know, thank you very much, but we want our idol back, we want our god back. Sultan says, fine, I've got a storeroom, lots of idols are in there, you go pick up whichever one is yours. Uh, now the fact is, idols were not kept in storerooms, so this is not historical, it's a legend. So they go there and they discover that the idol is missing. Now, the twist in the story is that the idol has been picked up by the Sultan's daughter and she's been playing, it, playing with it like a doll, which means she dresses it, she feeds it, puts it to sleep, etc. Here again there's a twist, which is that in Hindu worship, that's how you venerate Hindu deities. You wake them up in the morning, you dress them, you feed them, take them for baths, you put them to sleep in the evening. So essentially by playing with this deity, she was essentially doing bhakti. She was, you know, and the, the temple chronicles are a little mischievous. They say that during the day she played with the doll as a doll. By night, the deity took human form and played games with her. So you can read what you want into it. <laughs> and, you know, now she, she goes to sleep. The God agrees to go back with them. The Sultan is fascinated by this animate idol that's talking to him. Uh, they, they get off on their way. Begum wakes up and she realizes, hold on, you know, where's my beloved gone? So she then starts following these people. Now, here they split into two groups. One group takes the idol to a secret uh, place in Tirupati to hide it. And there's a whole adventure about how the idol eventually comes back decades later through a blind fisherman, etc., uh, washerman, who can identify it based on the, the, the features, etc. And she now shows up in Sri Rangam, where she finds that her beloved uh, deity is no longer there. And she collapses in the pangs of Viraha or separation and dies over there. And the legend says that when the deity finally came back decades later to Sri Rangam, he said that this particular lady, he had a, this Muslim princess, he had a, acknowledged her as his consort, so she must be given a place in the temple. So in the Sri Rangam temple, she's venerated as a painting in the wall, a veiled uh, woman. And even today when the deity comes out for his procession over there, she, he's fed North Indian food as prasad, chapatis and things like that. And he's wrapped in a colourful lungi, which was the mark of the peninsula Muslim, the, the mapla in Kerala essentially, but also Muslims up the coast. They were seen as people who wore colourful lungi. So that is how the god is draped even today. In the Melkote temple, it's slightly different. She has an actual idol for herself. She's not a mere uh, wall painting. But it's the same legend, two different temples. The question is, did this woman actually exist? Very unlikely. Uh, did somebody go all the way to Delhi, discover where the idol is, come back? Did the idol talk? All of that seems very unlikely. But what were they doing? They were amending customs slightly. They realised suddenly these invaders came. There were Muslims who had become part of uh, local society. 
they said, okay, fine, we need to locate these people somewhere in our culture, somewhere in our Sanskritic worldview. So they create a space and a niche for a Tuluka Nachiar. Tuluka comes from Turushka or Turkish or Muslim. Nachiar is princess. So in the Sri Rangam temple, along with this Hindu deity, there is a Muslim princess. Because they're saying, fine, these people are there, we'll create a, a space. So when we now deal with them in future, we have a you're fitting them again into an Indian metaphor. As I said with the Vijayanagar Ashwapati, um, uh, the sultans being called Ashwapatis, you're again taking them, a foreign element that's come into your country, and you yourself are indigenizing it by finding spaces for their religion as well as their uh, political power in your own existing Sanskritic worldview. Because Indian tradition has always been malleable. It's always been capable of responding to change. That is how it survived for so long. It's not, as I said, it's not a rock that you put in a box and say, this is tradition, we must protect it at all costs. That way tradition becomes very brittle, it, it won't survive. It survives because it responds to time, it responds to change. And I think with that I will end, because this has been going on for very long. <laughs>